Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Home Tech Podcast. Jason Griffin here. So happy to have you with us. I am joined, as always, by my partner, Seth Johnson. Seth, how's it going? A little cold, man. It's a little cold this week. Oh, bundle <laughs> as up. As promised from, from last week, I said it was going to be cold. It's cold. Yeah, down, down in Florida. So what d- define cold for me? All right. I, I've got, I did the math ahead of time this time. So it's 64 degrees, and in centigrade, that is about 18. Oof. 64 people in Florida yeah. must be freaking out. You know, it's it's funny. It's funny you say that because this time uh this time the, the of your if you go to Walmart or any store like that where they have space heaters, they're just all gone. <laughs> like the whole shelf has been empty. Like it's a hurricane so, like where they a have a run on the grocery stores. Gone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's they're just it's the, usually those shelves like they have three or four of those things in stock at any point in time here in Florida and then all of a sudden uh it, it goes down below Drops 60 below degrees and, and, 70. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And people are just like, oh no, <laughs> you know, there, there's a lot of people in blood thinners here. So, um, <laughs> it, it, it gets cold. It gets cold. That's, that's a fair point. You know, what's funny is that it was actually, I think like, uh, mid to upper seventies here in, in Denver today. So we actually, oh wow. I'm in a bit of an Indian summer and, and, uh, warmer, warmer day than you, but, um, enough about the weather, right? Let's jump in here. We've got a, another busy show. Um, want to, you know, before we dive in, we're just going to be you and me, Seth, no guest this week. Uh, we got a number of stories we're going to dissect and, and kick around. But of course, before we do that, I want to uh, lead out like we typically do by thanking our patrons of the podcast here. If you're interested in learning how you can support our efforts here at the Home Tech Podcast, head on over to hometech.fm slash support. Once again, that's hometech.fm slash support. And that's where you can learn about contributing to our efforts here for as little as a dollar a month. We've got a bunch of people on board doing that, and we really, really appreciate it. So thank you so much uh, to all of our patrons. And uh, if you're interested, head on over to the website to learn more. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, everybody who uh, who's who's decided to, uh, to contribute a uh, dollar or more or there on, on the patron. Uh, we really do appreciate it. And I also do appreciate everybody uh, joining us over there in the live channel uh, for the Home Tech Live show. Uh, here that recording on Wednesdays, typically, it looks like we're starting pretty good now, around 7.30. Uh, that, yep. that, that does change. So keep an eye on Twitter and keep an eye on that home tech live page. Uh, if you see that it's live, it, it should, should, you should be able to connect to the live server by hitting the little play button. And then there's a little chat thing that you can get into and be, and be part of the chat here and part of the show every week. That's so right. uh, th- thanks to everybody who helps out that way too. Yeah, we do aim for a consistent start time, you know, Wednesday around seven thirty Eastern, but schedules get a little bit more fluid once uh kids enter the equation, don't they? Yep. Yeah, they they do. <laughs> they really, really do. Yeah, yeah. Kids so. and yeah, yeah. And and now uh, we've got some guests coming up too, so we should kind of tease that a little bit. We we know that uh, we're, we're about to start getting the guest season back going, and uh, yep. So that typically the guest part, we we do that right off the bat, and then come in a little bit later. So keep that in mind. Like I said, if you just keep an eye on Twitter, uh, you'll be able to see when we're starting and stopping there on Wednesday Wednesday yeah. evenings. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, before we jump into the news here, Seth, you uh, had another uh, a great find for for picture of the week this week. Tell us about it. Yeah, so this this is a little um, thing that I saw going back and forth uh, between uh, Richard and uh, Robert Spivak, which I think he's he's uh, he's been on a listener of the show too. Uh, he yep. might be in the hub too. Oh yeah, uh, but he, yeah, he is. Yeah, so he's he's got this really cool hack uh, that that I haven't seen or thought of. Uh, and it's using a, a garage door um, opener to uh, or a sensor on a garage door to determine whether the garage door is closed or open. And the way they've done this, he's got a cool little video here um, that we'll link to in the show notes. Uh, um, he's got a contact sensor mounted to what is just essentially a, a door hinge. And when the, the garage door goes up, the door hinge kind of falls down. The sensor, the weight of the sensor pulls the sensor down and it disconnects from the magnet. And that way, you know, the door's open. So... I thought it was pretty clever. I, I I should have really thought of that when I did mine. I'm looking over my shoulder, like I did this really elaborate thing where I put like one of those commercial grade security contacts on it and like ran the wire <laughs> down right. to it. And uh, this this would have done the, the same job, except a whole lot quicker. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very clever. Uh, Leverage is gravity there to to do the hard work for you, and uh, really smart, good idea, actually a. A solid picture of the week because it it beat out mine, Seth, which is a a, a picture of my shiny new uh, Neo remote, which I'm excited 
to say yes. I, I have in hand. They are they are in the wild. Um, I went back and looked because I couldn't remember, and it was back on episode fifty five when we had Raphael on from Neo. That was, was fresh off of the heels of their really wildly successful Kickstarter campaign that they did, and um, you know we've we've periodically been giving updates on them uh, throughout those couple of years that it's been, and uh, you know they're they're. I know as a team, very excited to be finally shipping. I, I had a chance to speak with them out at Cedia and uh, just got my hands on one of these remotes to kick the tires on uh, yesterday. So I spent a little bit of time setting that up last night. Got a really basic setup going on right now. Um, wanted to dive in and, and get it going and, and just see you know what that setup process was like. And um, it's v- so far very impressed. You know, the remote is... Uh, I've always been a fan of of how it feels in the hand. It's it's a really really nice product. The the packaging that it came in was was top notch. I mean, they spared no expense on that. It was a very very nice unboxing experience for whatever that's worth. I I think it's it's cool how, you know, different companies approach that and it was very I would say Apple-esque in terms of the the unboxing and so far the the user experience has been great. So I look forward to sharing a little bit more as I I have more of an opportunity to test it and really get to use it over a period of time. And we're definitely going to try to do a review uh, over on the Home Tech website, hometech.fm, um, as I as I work through that. Yeah, so, and you're just using it as like a standalone one-room solution, right? I am, yeah. I'm, I'm just using it right now to control our uh, our, our family room, uh, entertainment center. Um, so not uh, certainly not a heavy, heavy-duty user of it. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot you can but- do with this thing. I think that's what they were kind of aiming for. Um, totally. I mean, initially, yeah. that's kind of what you have to aim for because doing like multi-room audio, I, I think it does integrate with Sonos, but um, I, doing doing a lot more like with video distribution and that kind of thing, uh, it's kind of adds just a lot of variables into uh, into the system. But uh, I, I think aiming for those, you know, single room Logitech Harmony remote type, you know, uh, replacement type systems, I, I think this is really looks like a great option. I, I hope to get mine soon. I... I I know that they've reached out to me a couple times, and I just I've got to get back to them. So yeah, hopefully, I'll be hopefully I'll be really I'll curious. Yeah, I know you have some some bigger plans uh, in terms of of integration and and uh, doing maybe even some development against it. Uh, and so I really look forward I, to. I, I'd have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, everything really is look... not in one room in my house. It's it's all over the house. So yeah, right. So anyways, we'll we'll keep everybody posted about that again. I, I took a bunch of pictures during the setup process and. Uh, plan to do a review but so far so good really uh, a great remote and uh easy setup process and and certainly haven't had any any problems to speak of and really you can just feel uh the quality on this thing it's it's amazing in fact i was took the charging base for the remote out of the box last night and i was like just shocked at i i don't know why it's it's so heavy i guess maybe for stability when the remote is sitting in there uh, but really, you know, a just sturdy feeling remote, got a very good build out. Uh, the quality on it is definitely there uh, in, in terms of the, the industrial design. So we all knew that. Um, and really the, the big question will be, you know, just seeing how it, how it performs over time. And, and of course, the one thing, Seth, I'm, I'm most nervous about that I'm sure you can relate to is uh, it, the, the environment of my family room and, and with two young kids, uh, running around, I know how they like to get their hands on remote, so that's something we're definitely going to have to be pretty pretty careful about. Yeah, I was I was actually thinking about that when you were talking about the base. I'm like, well, how, how I wonder I wonder how kid proof I'd be able to make this because uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna yep. I'm gonna put it like on the kitchen counter, like way up high out of reach. That's the <laughs> that is the challenge. But uh, let let's jump in. We've got a number of news stories here. We want to start out with, I'd say the the big one that that really came out of right field. I I was reading the about this and um was a little bit a little bit surprised by it. It's an interesting move by Amazon. Uh they've got a new uh a cloud cam. Is the first thing I want to touch on. There's a couple of layers uh to this story, but let's let's start by picking up, you know, picking up on the uh on the hardware. So you've got you've got a cloud cam. This is really uh you know, if you look at the picture of it, it looks very much like a like a drop cam or a nest cam, similar form factor. Uh, so same idea there. $119 uh, 1080p camera. This is set for release uh, November 8th in uh, selected markets. It does have some looks like optional subscription services that range from $699 to about up to $20 a month. Um, it does have a free tier is worth mentioning that uh, lets users do uh, 24 hours worth of uh, video storage 
and uh, has support for up to three cameras. So those additional uh, priced tiers get you other features like uh, it says person detection, extended cloud storage, and up to 10 cameras. So I'm reading from a, a story from, from GeekWire here. So interesting entrant, I guess not surprising really to for Amazon to have have a product like this uh, come to market. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and also, I I was just it, it, what was really cool to me is this this has um like two way audio and it has a built into it, right? So that that's that's kind of not really like you could put this in. This could could I wonder if this could replace an Echo? Like it, it seems like it's an Echo camera, right? Yeah, that's that's the impression I get. And and at that price point, I mean, they are they are straight up going head to head against uh, Nest Cam and Arlo. I guess the new Nest Cam. Uh, I think they announced that it had Google Assistant built into it, the the new 4K one. So that's that, right. That'll be kind of comparable, except it'll have 4K video instead of 1080p. Um, uh, Arlo was just still kind of be out there, not doing you know just doing the Arlo thing. Um, but this really goes head to head with with Nest Cam and at a price point that's much much less expensive. I think. Um, I, I was pretty impressed by this. <laughs> like, you said, like you said, this this came out of nowhere. Like this is one of those things that Amazon does. Uh, we wake up one day and, and turn on the news and and look, uh, Amazon wants to put uh, cameras inside of the house so uh, so they can see what's going on and they also give you uh, the ability to integrate it with some of their other services, which I know we'll talk about here. The the the, the key thing, um, but. Yeah, also, which to me was a really surprising well, part of the of the story was, and that's how I saw it, right? I mean, that's how that's how this was introduced. Right. Like they really didn't talk about the camera, um, but and, and, and as much as they, you know, the news stories went around, you know, Amazon wants to let people into your home, um, but I, I don't know. I I think this is a this little camera is a a really uh, decent price for it. I mean, I I'm kind of considering like I may get one from my garage and just sit it out here and. So I can keep an eye on the garage, you know, when, when I'm not around. I don't know. I, I don't know, Seth. It's still like <laughs> five or six times the amount of, uh, of what, what is it? The wise camera that you, <laughs> yeah. that you posted on her. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the, tw- the $20 Wi-Fi camera, um, $20 from China. Uh, I, I wonder, <laughs> I wonder how that one's going to work out, uh, long-term, <laughs> but it does look interesting. Right. So yeah, well, you don't buy it for the reliability yeah, or the looks. I mean, this thing is kind of ugly <laughs> or the <Yeah>. looks <laughs> we'll, we'll post a link uh, to that. Um, the reverse Wally, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Cannot believe $20, but, but yeah, I, you know, coming back to Amazon, I, that to me was a, a little bit of a surprising part of the story. And I almost feel like maybe a, a marketing or PR misstep in the sense of, I felt like they they could have really made made some hay with the camera had they just announced it standalone and then maybe waited at least a day or two to to do this other part which we're going to talk about now, um, which is Amazon's key service or key app. Uh, they really rolled those two announcements up together, so they came out simultaneously. And this key app is, I guess, sort of a companion app. I've I've heard it referred to uh, to the to the cloud cam and and. What this app does is allows uh, users, uh, Prime members, I should note, uh, so it's restricted to Prime members, to give uh, access to their house to trusted providers. So dog clean, uh, dog walkers, cleaners, package delivery companies is a big one that they show on a video that we'll also include a link to on the show notes. And the way that this works is it integrates with select third-party locks. So if you watch the the video on on the Amazon site, it's got... Saw a couple from Quickset, and I think one from Yale when they scrolled down through the video. I don't know if that's all of them. There may be, there may be others, but effectively, it it integrates with those locks, and then in some way, shape, or form, the user is able to indicate that, "Hey, I've got this package uh, being delivered to my house," and go ahead and open the front door when you get there and throw it inside because I don't want it left out on the, you know, in front of my door. So, uh, really, I. I would say a strange offering. I I hadn't. It doesn't occur to me to to use that. I I don't know that I'll ever uh, be a customer or a consumer of this of this offering. But the interesting thing I thought was that they really paired up these announcements, right? And the the news of this new camera sort of got lost in uh, these stories about why on earth would you give Amazon access th- to your front door? Uh, so there was inter- bit, a bit of an interesting strategy there. I I, I think it's probably the better strategy, right? Because if they had just come out with a camera, it would have, you know, we would have talked about it because I thought it was it's an interesting camera. 
uh, 1080p video, 119 price point. Um, also has like BTLE and Amazon, uh, the Alexa built into it. I mean, that's that's an interesting thing. But now Amazon wants to make people, you know, open up the open up your door and let you know some creepy weirdo Amazon person drop off a box inside the house. Like now, there's something people will talk about. So I think I think they did the <laughs> the PR push on this uh, a little bit better. I, I say that because it, I mean. I could almost like I, I've met the UPS guy that comes by and, and like he's the same UPS guy that comes by every day. Like I could almost like see myself like tempted to say, OK, UPS has got this program set up where I can open my garage maybe and let him put a box inside and as long as I had a camera. Not my house, not not my house at all, but maybe my garage. Uh, the people that come from Amazon <laughs> are just a different breed unto them of themselves. Like uh, I don't think I would let them in the house or the garage. So. Uh, <laughs> it, it's usually yeah. just a, a strange white yeah. van that pulls up uh, without <laughs> right. without announcement or anything. Somebody's just at your door dropping off a package and then they leave and you're like, it's something outside. I thought I heard something. And sure enough, you open the door and, and there's a package sitting there. So uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, Amazon has a little ways to go with their delivery door at et, door etiquette, I think before. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I feel, before you let them in, <laughs> before I'm letting them in anywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's I, you know I I don't know. I guess there will be younger consumers, uh, pre- predominantly. I would think that'll be a little bit more comfortable with this. I I realized as you were talking, I didn't do a great job of connecting the dots there, so to speak. So the the camera, the where this ties in, and you you sort of alluded to it is is the ability to watch uh, delivery live, like when they walk up to your door, I, I presume it'll trigger the key app and you'll get a notification that they're there and you'll be able to to keep an eye on them to make sure they just drop it off and leave. Or uh, you'll also be able to view the video of that delivery after it's completed. So I, I don't know, bit of a, a strange offering. I'll be very curious to see uh, how this is taken up in the market. Uh, the Amazon key in-home kit, which includes the the cloud cam the Amazon cloud cam as well as a compatible smart lock sells for two hundred and forty nine dollars so not a bad price point if you're interested um, but uh, like I said in my opinion a bit of a a bit of a strange offering still trying to figure this one out yeah I, I could see this people kind of freak out about this but uh, I mean in my line of work uh, and and granted like we were a little more trusted than than the average Amazon delivery person. But at the same time, like most of the customers that I worked for um, had no problem and still have no problem to this day saying, oh, the house is open or here's my code to get into the house. Or That's true. I mean, they, they would let me in at any point in time. Like I could just show up and at, at eight o'clock at night if they weren't home and they would either unlock the door or tell me how to get in and I would be in. Um or some of them go go so far as to give us a key, you know, like that 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 was a problem for a while, <laughs> where we were trying to figure out how to manage keys for, you know, should we lock them up in a lockbox or something along those lines. But we'd we'd have keys to clients' home, so I I don't know if it's like I, I know at my house there's there's no way that's that's gonna happen with <laughs> my wife. <laughs> like it's just it, it, I think it's I think it's right. like maybe a cultural thing, but I, I don't know. Maybe wealthier people are more. I don't know. Like it seemed like the more wealthy the person was, like the more often they just had random people wandering through their house. Um, and I'm not sure what that is if they just kind of always expect a service person to be there. Um, some of the houses that I work for, they have a staff, a full time staff, and there's always somebody in the house, maybe two or three people in the house, depending on how big the house was. Um, so right. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe it's just different expectations of of how how it goes. But this this delivery thing where. Uh, you know the the delivery companies can open up uh, open up your door and drop off a package inside. You know this this may work better for like. Um, and I was thinking about this not really so much my house, but like if I had an apartment, uh, you know, in one of those apartment buildings and 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 just had one of those common hallways, like in, even interior hallways, I wouldn't want a package sitting outside. Like I, I definitely would. Right. I, I, I would probably sign up for something like this. And just have the camera sitting at the door and I could see if the person, the you know, Amazon person came in or came out nine times. Let's be frank about this. Like they don't have time to come in and rob your house. <laughs> They've got packages to deliver. So they're just right. going to come in, drop the thing off and leave as fast as they can. And, you know, I, I, I think this would probably work for me if I was in that situation where 
I, I didn't want a package still yeah, off, it's a good off point. my front lawn. So I don't know. It, it may work for me, uh, but I could definitely see how this wouldn't work for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. There are, there are some use cases there. I, I think that's a great one you point out and certainly <clears throat> will be of interest to, to some people on the market. But like I said, I, I don't think I'll, I'll be one of them. Not, not anytime soon anyways. So we'll, we'll see. But um, speaking of smart locks, wanted to quickly uh, touch on this. Not a whole lot to say about this story, but worth mentioning that uh, smart lock company August, August Home, as, as people may be familiar with them, was, uh, was acquired last week by the parent company of Yale. So a little bit of consolidation going on in the smart lock space. Uh, the parent company is called Asa Abloy. Asa Abloy. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, they were purchased. I guess the terms of the deal are not being disclosed. I had initially read a story that said uh, 60 million, but upon a little bit of further research, I think that was misreported. There was that figure was floating around in a bunch of those stories, but 60 million was actually the I guess anticipated revenues for 2018 for August. So um, I think people were maybe trying to extrapolate from that what the acquisition might have been worth. My understanding is that's that's undisclosed, but uh, presumably good news for the team at August um, will remain to be seen if it's good for consumers uh, in terms of that consolidation uh, that's happening in the smart home market or the smart lock market. It's an interesting talking point because August was. Uh, kind of the leader in this field, right? They they were we announced a couple of weeks definitely back. definitely one of them. Yeah, we ne- we announced a couple of weeks back, or they announced a couple of weeks back that they had a program that they were working with with um, maybe maybe Walmart or something where they could they could they were teaming up with them to do deliveries and let people into the house. Um, I think this was a couple of weeks ago. I know that they talked about it maybe a year ago uh, when when they were really you know, saying that this was something that they were going to bring to market and everybody was kind of scratching their heads about how that would work. Um, but it, it, that's interesting. I mean, they're, they're talking about um, teaming up with Yale, which is this, the Asa Abla, whatever it is. <laughs> See, I'm messing up. Sounds uh, like an eighties, sounds like an eighties rock band. Or yeah. Something. Yeah. I'm messing up. Asa Abla. There we go. <laughs> Asa, whatever. Uh, let's see. Uh, so that's um that's interesting that's that it's that company because uh, I think the Amazon uh key is also using Yale Lock. So I wonder if it's kind of like uh like a joining up of technology there. I, I don't know I thought I read that um that August had patented this this type of deployment where, where you'd have a smart lock and be able to let people in. But uh maybe I'm just hmm. thinking too hard on that and misremembering something. It, Definitely could be the case. Lack of sleep and all. Um, yeah, but, it happens. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. This is this, this is a good. Uh, this is a. It, it seems like lock companies like they, they are. There's there's only like a couple of them, right? Like you, you really like here in the states, you only have a, a very small choice of what lock you you put on the the front door, uh, and you kind of have to live with their, um, technology that they they have and and live with the features that they present, uh, like quick set. I know is different than Slage and Baldwin is something else. I think Baldwin and Yale are almost the same thing. So th- there's not much choice between brands here. And it, it sounds like uh, maybe in, in the world of smart locks, we have one less choice at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And it may just be one of those markets, you know, there's certainly markets out there like it. And in fact, I was, was traveling last weekend and, and learned something I, I didn't know, Seth, totally unrelated to home tech, but uh, rental cars, you know, you think there's like 15 different, companies and in fact there's like two that own them yeah i actually didn't know that so you know totally unrelated but there are markets that are like that for whatever reason where uh you you there are different brands but if you kind of follow them up the chain they're uh, functioning under the same uh, parent companies or ownership and you can only hope that they'll uh they won't you know that that fact doesn't sort of stymie innovation or, or competition the way that uh, I guess I would argue that it has in the rental car market, right? That's not a, exactly a market that's known for a great uh, customer experience, but um, we'll see. So uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Moving on to the next story here, another entrant into the DIY home security market. So Wink is has come out with their uh, apparently called the Lookout system. This, of course, following on the heat right on the heels, Seth, of uh, and we've now had Ring announce a, a DIY security system, Nest. We had that Smart Things and ADT collaboration get announced recently, and now you've got Wink. So crazy. The security market is really uh, exploding with options now. They've got um, 
It's got $199. You get a, a second generation Wink Hub, two window door sensors, a motion sensor, a siren, and a chime. So that's what uh, the $199 will get you. I think it's safe to say this is uh, this is that will I am money at work, right? <laughs> there you go. Wink's doing something. <laughs> Yep, I. <laughs> this is this is this is what happens when a uh, a multi talented artist uh, slash rapper invests in your company. Totally, uh, sky's the limit. Keep moving your product. Yeah, you'll move your product right along. I <laughs> I don't know. This is this is pretty cool. I, I wonder if since this is like a a DIY like no monitoring solution, I think that um I think it'd be interesting to see if in the future they announce something that allows f- connection with some kind of platform. Um, Kind of like what Smart Smart Things is doing with ADT. Like I, I know that ADT and some other lo- like Moni uh, have introduced kind of these IoT type plans uh, for devices like this that just need monitoring of uh, open and closed sensors, uh, and just basically converting it over from a, like a DIY and, and giving you a professional monitoring option on it. I, I wonder if they'll do that in the future. I, I hope they do because it. It, it this market i think we talked about the security market for a long time like it, it's really hasn't had any disruption in it um and right now there's there still is none other than maybe ring i think ring is probably the one that's disrupting the most with their 199 price point slash what is it a hundred hundred dollars a year for video everything like if you pay a hundred dollars a year you get video and professional monitoring so i i think that they're the ones like pushing the prices down but Everybody else is kind of floating around the same price point. Right. Right. That, you know, that was the, um, one of the interesting things to me about this story, you, I, I actually hadn't thought of until you, you mentioned Will I Am and the, the acquisition there a while back. You know, one of the layers of that story that people spoke about was this company's really got to start figuring out the service model. And, you know, they clearly, when they came out, they, they didn't stay viable with their small hardware pricing and, you know, that was really their their model, right? Was to try to build that platform, and so there was speculation that they the, their next move maybe to get into more subscription based uh, pricing models, and that's not here, right? I expected when I read the story to to see that. In hindsight, you would have you would have thought that there would be some sort of monitoring option or or subscription fee, but this is purely a DIY uh, monitoring solution. So there is no professional monitoring, and of course, no monthly fees uh, along with that. So. We'll see how it does in the market. Could be a good option for, certainly a good option for anybody who's already in that Wink ecosystem. Um, you can buy the security accessories a la carte, of course, so you don't have to go purchase that package. Presumably, if you've already got a, a second generation Wink Hub, uh, you can go out and buy some of those and and uh, could be a good option for anybody looking for you know self-monitoring DIY type of solution. So we'll see how... We'll see how it does. Um, moving on here, want to touch on a couple of voice control stories. So Amazon, uh, of course, had the Echo uh, Gen 2 come out recently. And Seth, you picked up a, a review of this uh, this week and I, I think wanted to touch on a couple of, of points that you took away from that. Yeah, so the the reviews are out on the Amazon Echo Gen 2. And uh they are they are not as uh, as good as they, as I think Amazon was probably hoping. Um, we've got one over here at Tom's Guide. Uh, they are saying it you know it's good that it's less expensive. It looks a little more attractive, um, and you can kind of change out uh, the covers to kind of match your decor. Uh, but guess what? It doesn't sound as good as the original Echo, which is uh, which is not a good thing. Not saying because- much. <laughs> No, the the, uh, <laughs> the original Echo did not sound good at all. That's kind of one of the the you know, knocking points on it for, for yeah. quite some time was that it, it did not sound good. Yep. I, I have the original echo here and I am by no means an, an audio snob and, and it's, you know, it's, it's fine for me, but it's certainly not, um, certainly not something I would qualify as, as good audio quality. So when you, uh, when you hear that the second one sounds worse, that's a bit of a bummer, but, uh, you know, worth reading that review if you're considering it and also worth mentioning that they reviewed the, I think like the smaller of the two, yeah. right? Like this was not the Echo Plus, right? Um, which is another option that presumably one would hope sounds sounds better uh, than the original. Yeah, I I think that that I mean that one looks more like the one you and I have, right? Um, yep. So I, I I would think that the bigger tube or whatever makes it have a little bit more sound quality, um, but I'm not sure that what is good about uh, the Amazon uh, Echo platform is that 
it has that stuff built into it and you can get Sonos now. Uh, if you have a Sonos speaker, you can, you can yell at, uh, the Amazon speaker to play something in a particular room and it'll play some songs or play, connect to a music service and play it for you. And you'll actually, like I was doing that today. I, I told it to play some, some music and it started coming out of the, uh, the echo and I'm like, Oh, that's, that's horrible. <laughs> so I told it to stop and then told it to play out of the Sonos. And it's like, okay, yeah, that sounds a lot better. Uh, and then after one song, it stopped playing and didn't connect anymore. So, um, there's still some bugs I think there that need to be worked out on the, the Sonos integration with it. I think it's still in beta. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, so hopefully they'll get those things worked out, but man, how it's so much better just being able to yell at, uh, yell at the tube on the kitchen counter and then get, um, decent sound quality coming out of uh, yeah. the Sonos speakers, uh, that are kind of around the house. Well, we got through that section, I think with only one uh, Alexa. So I just wanted to throw a second one in there because I didn't want editing t- to be too easy for you. Thanks, man. Thanks. <laughs> when we when we started that section, Greg in the live chat room uh, turned said he was turning his off, which I think was was smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's always a smart move. Actually, anytime you're listening to the show, you never know when a wild Alexa will fly by. Uh, <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, moving on here from Echo, we've got uh, a story: Microsoft Cortana and Insteon partnering up. So. Uh, just this past Friday, October 20th, Microsoft announced the availability of the Harman Kardon Invoke with Cortana. And Seth, I understand that you've you've seen one of these out in the wild. Yep. I, I was wandering through the mall, I think on Friday or Saturday, and um, saw it sitting there and said, oh, that's one of those uh, Harman Kardon things. I should probably take a picture of that and post it online. Um, it wasn't working. Like, well, they had, didn't have it plugged in. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it just looked like a nice little thing sitting there. Um, and in the mall, it was way too loud to actually, um, hear anything. I, I, I said, oh, well, I can't demo it because, uh, this thing probably wouldn't even pick me up. So, and I don't know, it it was sitting there. It looked interesting. Uh, I just wish that the retail experience at, at the Microsoft store, no, no less would, would be a little bit better where you could get in there and actually, um, demo the thing because they had every other, they had like kids in there doing dance moves in front of something, you know, and they're. They're just dancing away. It was actually quite funny to watch this little kid do something with probably one of those dance games in the back. Um, right. But everything else you can put your hands on. Like you can touch the computer, the Surface tablets. You can play with all that stuff. But the, the thing that you really want to interact with, something that, you know, just comes out like that. Uh, literally the first, you know, couple of days that it's out, like you can't you can't mess with. So uh, I thought the the retail experience wasn't so great with that. Yeah, a little bit lacking there. Uh, a couple other details on this story. Insteon uh, is a, quote, core partner of uh, <clears throat> of Microsoft on this, or, or Harman Kardon, I guess, of the Invoke. Uh, they're, a, they're a core partner of that product. Uh, worth noting, they have been, uh, I, went, I had to went, go back and look this up because I remembered, uh, but didn't remember how long it had been. Microsoft and Insteon announced a uh, partnership back in May of 2014. So they've been, those two companies have been working together and collaborating at some level for for a little while now, um, and Insteon is a a core partner on this new product. So uh, you can command your Insteon devices right out of the box if you go and purchase an Invoke. So pretty cool, worth knowing for for Insteon users. One of the things that I pulled out of a story from DigitalTrends.com is where I'm reading this from, and thought was interesting. I haven't had a chance to dig in and figure out how much if if this is quoted accurately, but it says. You can say commands like, hey, Cortana, can you check uh, that the garage lights are off, turn on the porch light, set the security system, and turn down the heat. And then, oh, quote, cool. rest assured that the AI system will take care of all these requests. So if if it can, in fact, do those all in turn and you're able to issue multiple commands, that would be a pretty pretty cool deal because that's that's limited to only a, there's only a couple of platforms that I know of that can do that. And that would be, I guess, Cortana purportedly and then, of course, Josh AI. Right, that's what I was just thinking. That seems to be their their domain and their selling point over at over at uh, Josh AI is that you can chain requests like that and have have Josh uh, essentially execute every one of those um, as needed. And uh, that's that's pretty interesting to see that they're doing that. Um, another thing on the timing, I I want to say it was around the beginning of or the end of last year uh, when we had on the show and our as we have most every year, I think. Uh, our fireside chat with Mike and Richard. Uh, I think Richard were, uh, was teasing, or maybe Richard and Mike were both teasing at the time 
uh, that there, we were going to see some integrations come in with Cortana. And I think sometime in, in January, we, we saw that Harden Conrad had announced this product and now it's taken this long. Wow. I mean, we're used to Amazon and Apple kind of just like dropping stuff on us on a, on a random Wednesday morning. Um, these guys have taken months to get this out. <laughs> so right. uh, here we are close to the end of the year and this, this thing's finally hitting the shelves. Yeah. Better, better late than never, I suppose. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Ho- hopefully this takes off. It'd be interesting to see what they get to do with it. Um, especially with the, like a Titan integration with Insteon, uh, using Cortana like that. I, I think it, uh, could be pretty good. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. One other small thing I wanted to touch on in the category of voice control, Google home has announced, uh, some new features really designed for families with kids, 50 new games, uh, activities, and stories, uh, positioning these as uh, a mechanism to, you know, use this technology to bring uh, your family together. And as silly as it sounds, again, going back to kids, we've mentioned a few times, I, I like this story. I, I know that my two-year-old, who, as hard as it is for my wife and I to believe, turns three in, in less than a month, uh, she wow. just, she loves. Hard, hard for me to believe yeah. too, man. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> wow. Yeah. 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 Time flies, but, um, you know, she loves, she loves our Alexa. And I think as she gets older, uh, you know, she'll, she'll enjoy fun, quirky stuff like that. And I think anytime like technology can be used to actually have a good time, you know, some of the things they mention is, uh, like magical or what's it called? Magical chairs or music, no musical chairs. Um, you know, some other games that, uh, that kids can play with it and, it's fun, a little bit silly, but uh, I, I like it. Didn't didn't Google was it Google or Amazon that released? It's hard, with all these product releases right now. It's one of these had like these Bluetooth buttons that came out. I think it was, I thought it was Google. Maybe it's Amazon. I do um, vaguely remember that. I I don't remember which one did it, but maybe, I do remember. Maybe that. somebody in the chat room can can yell at us. But you know, I I I agree. These the games that you can play with these little voice assistants is actually they're actually pretty fun. Um, we. When we're sitting down at dinner, sometimes uh, we'll play the uh, the Jeopardy one, and yep. my wife and I will be trying to answer some of these hard Jeopardy questions, and and then we play the Teen Jeopardy one, uh, and and because uh, we we can nail all those questions <laughs> between the two of us, <laughs> but yeah. real Jeopardy is a little bit little bit uh, different animal. So uh, that that's a that's a Greg Greg in the chat rooms of verifying that Amazon had the buttons, uh, and they. It's kind of what I remembered. Uh, they yep. were little Bluetooth buttons that you could use to play games, and you know, whoever had the quickest re- reaction uh, could buzz in and answer the question. I guess. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll throw a link as you were. Thank you, Greg, for for calling our attention to that. I'll I'll throw a link up in the uh, so we can get it on the show notes. They've Echo buttons for at home trivia games uh, using. Alexa. There you go, Seth. One more. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> no problem. Um, <laughs> So let's uh, let's move on. Couple couple more stories here we want to touch on, and, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Lutron suing Legrand, and this is nothing new for Lutron. They're they're kind of known for for going out and doing patent enforcement. They really hold all of the patents around lighting control. People don't um, if they're not heavily involved in the smart home or, or have a background in it, they they may not realize. But Lutron really, you know, they literally invented the dimmer. And they also invented a lot of the smart technology that, that followed on the heels of that to to drive uh, lighting control. So they're going after Legrand here. Um, I understand there was a, an original lawsuit they filed back in August of 2017. So a little over, no, just, wait, 2017? That was just, just a couple of months ago, or last yeah. year. Oh, no, no, sorry. Wait, is yeah, it 2017 this... right now? Yeah. <laughs> What year? Here we is are it? back on the math. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I was doing. I was like, wait a minute. I don't know if the story is misreporting that or if that meant to say 2016. But in any event, this is not the first time. The first uh, lawsuit was dismissed without prejudice, which means you know Lutron can come after them again. The fact that they dismissed it doesn't imply uh, that that the case was settled or that there wasn't uh, a patent infringement. It's interesting. I mean, Lutron Lutron's on the prowl again. Uh, I, I, I'm sure many integrators remember uh, what man. It was a couple of years back, I, probably six or seven years ago, maybe longer. Uh, that Lutron took out a hit on everybody in the industry. They were they were suing Control Four, Crestron, anybody who was making a lighting device that that had a, that had a, a, a smart capabilities in it. Uh, and I know that a bunch of companies ended up settling with them. I think Control Four it was one of those. I I'm pretty sure they were. Uh, and there was a little, 
Lutron tax that got added on to everyone, every dimmer that was sold. Uh, our prices on those things went up uh, simply to to comply the with Lutron that, that tax. lawsuit. That's so, right. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> there's always there's always a Lutron tax. <laughs> you, you'll come to yeah. find out working in this industry. Yeah, there's there's always a Lutron tax. It's kind of like uh, if you're if you're planning to design and sell a, a smart lighting product, you've got to sort of when you're doing your calculations and starting up your business, you've got to have that on your on your projections, right? Here's the line item where we plan on settling our lawsuit with Lutron. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Well, I mean they they have they have these patents in there. Um, they do, and and they have exercised them uh, in in the past, and they've won, or not so much won, but they they have ended up selling with the companies. I mean, I think it just kind of came down to uh, you know the companies throwing their hands up and saying, yeah, these are these are kind of in you know solid in here, and the lawsuits don't look like they're going to go the way they should. So um, here we go. But uh, I, I, a couple of these are they're interesting. Uh, the the system for uh, for controlling devices where where they they you know claim that they, that a that a Lutron the the patent actually goes into saying something like the uh, lighting devices or devices like lighting devices I guess it's any device that communicates with a centralized hub uh, and that hub communicates back like status is. Uh, that 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 one's kind of a, a super one of those super broad general patents. It's like that's going to be super hard for anybody to to beat, right? Right. That's like it, it's just about how everything works these days. Like it has. I mean, we had a freaking hub bell on this show for so long. <laughs> everybody was coming out with hubs to control their lights. So, right. man, I I or I don't know how anybody producing a uh, in wall dimmer uh, or lighting control system uh, is going to get around that at this point. Yeah. Yep. Well, <clears throat> we'll see. Um, like you said, it they not the first time they've done it. They've had some success before, and uh, you know they they hold some intellectual property, and they're they're within their rights to uh, go out and and defend it. So we'll we'll keep an eye on how that uh, <clears throat> how that shakes out. Last couple of stories that we want to touch on here are are semi related. So smart home device ownership up in the U.S. and then a, a follow up story we're going to hit on from CE Pro. Uh, great news for pros. Home automation is more confusing than ever, and kind of paired these stories up because I think there's there's quite a bit of overlap. the 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 first one, uh, this is a new study from uh, NPD, which is a, a market research group. It says a total of 15 percent of U.S. Uh, internet households currently own a home automation device. This is up from just 10 percent uh, back in April, and uh, the report also goes on to say that the uh, U.S. dollar sales of home automation products have increased uh, 43%, which is uh, impressive. Security, mon- security and monitoring continue to hold the largest share of that. Video doorbells, I, I, I want to double check this. I, I only read it from one source. Uh, show a growth of 123% uh, with smart lighting up 83%. So if these numbers are, are indeed accurate, uh, that's, those are pretty pretty impressive growth numbers. Yeah, I think we knew that the video doorbell stuff was was skyrocketing uh, i mean i've heard that in the past but 123 percent that's that's great it's crazy uh, yeah. yeah um i mean yeah you can see why everybody in the <laughs> in the game has a has a product either on the way or uh out that that is a video doorbell product i mean it's it's one of those super easy things to do but um 15 percent that, that's it's getting up there um i'm not ready to say like we're, we're definitely on the s curve and we seem to be you know, pulling ahead a little bit more, but uh, I, I'm I'm definitely not ready to say that this you know home automation thing and smart home devices that's is kind of a mainstream thing yet. Like it, we've got a long way to go before we reach uh, fifty or sixty percent, and uh, even a longer way to go before we reach those those laggards who, who insist on having analog technologies and flipping on their lights. You know. With with a switch, I mean ugh. animals. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah, with luddites, luddites is the word I'm looking for. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it it's it's definitely it definitely taking off. I think you know since we started doing this show um, three years ago now, it's been a while. Um, man, the, the industry's completely changed. We've seen people come and go. We've seen billions of dollars move around between companies and and people and more and more products come to market we've seen people uh, are giant corporations like apple and google jump you know feet first into the home animation world uh and it's only going to get crazier i mean we we've now we've got to start getting 
uh, mom and pops interested in, in smart home devices. Uh, and I, I think they are. I think we're starting to see more people kind of warm up to the idea of having um, smart cameras or, or like these video doorbells, obviously. That's a pretty good one. Um, my, my, my father actually just, you know, called me up the other day and said, Hey, those, uh, the spring spotlight cameras you guys keep talking about, uh, can I get a couple of those? And you know, I said, sure. And I had some shipped to him. He's already installed one of them. So uh, I, I definitely think, uh, the, these types of, uh, devices have their benefits. And I think the market is just proving that, uh, with, with these, with these growth numbers that we're seeing. Yeah, definitely. The, uh, one of the quotes that I actually pulled out of the story that, says the uh, Ben Arnold executive director uh, industry analyst for the NPD group says voice enabled speakers have also played a key role in catalyzing interest in the smart home. And I think that's, that's totally true. I mean, nothing earth shaking for anybody who listens to this show, certainly, but anecdotally, you know, we had my mom in town recently visiting for a little while and by no stretch of the imagination is my mom a a technology person or a smart home person, but you know, she saw us using the echo in the kitchen and, and really liked it and is sort of hinting that she might want one of those for, for Christmas. Right. And so we're, we're thinking about that. And, uh, you know, the, the thing that this made me think of is how it really is sort of like a gateway drug, right? Like you get the echo in your home and then I could totally see my dad, like getting a a point solution, like a, a thermostat, for example, where, hey, I can now use my voice to turn the heat up and down. And and so you get the you get those little touch points that start getting people thinking about the smart home for the first time that that may not otherwise have ever thought of it. And and I think that's what we're, like you said, really starting to see the beginning of that S curve where it is slowly becoming that mainstream adoption that we've talked about for so long. And, and we're just, I think, just now starting to see the first real signs of. Yep. Well, and and in other news, you know, it's more confusing now, right? That's that's what this other story is saying, that uh, people who are buying this stuff get it and they have no idea what to do with it, right? <laughs> right. That's that's the uh, the ever evergreen story, I suppose, when it comes to smart home or technology yeah. in general, right? Yeah, this was a piece uh, Julie over at CE Pro did and <clears throat> certainly think there's there's some great points in here and and not not dismissing the article outright by any stretch. But I I do, you know, part of me is like, reading the story where she talks about, okay, in the last couple of months, we've seen uh, Sonos works with Alexa, Ring Security, Nest Secure, the SmartThings ADT collaboration, Echo Plus, Best Buy doing some more things in terms of like their Vivint Pro install rollout and distributing these Ring and ADT products. And so she's using that as a springboard to talk about how this <clears throat> increased choice is, is actually great news for pros because the market is more confusing than ever, which I, I agree with. I, I do think it this more and more products are just creating more and more confusion for a lot of people. But part of me also looks at this and says, well, I think the smart home market has always been confusing, right? It's just that now there are more cheaper, you know, inexpensive products out there that, that I think are getting more people interested. So a little bit nuanced, but if you look at one person's perception of the smart home it's always been confusing i think what's really different now is that it's it's just as confusing it's it's just confusing for more people right so i i think it is good news for pros i i do think that there are of course it comes with its challenges as well these are all very inexpensive products in a in a market full of professionals that have uh, built their businesses around very specialized high margin equipment and of course that's the the big transition that we all spend a ton of time talking about so we don't need to belabor that. There are uh, a lot of conversations going on about that at any given time. But um, generally speaking, I think these consumers are are looking for an advocate. They're they're looking for, you know, what we at One Vision really call a technology manager. Uh, it's not so much about just the in- installation anymore. It's about really owning that whole experience from end to end and being an advocate uh, for your clients and making sure that they have a curated technology experience and help them work through that confusion and and, of course, work through issues if and when they do come up. I, I don't know if I agree with the the premise of the, the article here, uh, even the, that the consumer choice somehow leads to confusion. I mean, there there are a half dozen car company or car companies, car uh, retailers here in Sarasota that I can go to and buy any car made from, you know, here to Germany to Japan. And uh, each one of those does essentially the same thing, right? <laughs> I fill it up with gas and it drives or and some of them don't get filled up with gas. Uh, there is a Tesla dealership here. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm not confused <laughs> by a car, right? Um, I think, I think maybe 
some of the education, uh, you know, could go a little bit longer. Like people, people don't really under, still don't really understand when we talk about smart homes, uh, what it is. But I think once we reach, you know, this level of mass adoption, like, like we're still talking 15% of people have one device in their house. Like that's, that's nothing. When we start talking 30 and 40, there's going to be more of an expectation of what a security system does and what it, what it, what it is. Um, or there'll right. be more of a, uh, expectation of what a, uh, vi- an outdoor video camera is and does. So I, 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 I think the comparison to cars is, is, is apt. Like we're talking about something that is, is still very much in its early days, still, still very much dealing with early adopters and, and people that are interested in the technology, but definitely not something that it, that is mainstream as, as cars are, for example. Um, but it soon will be one day, right? Like we were talking about earlier, the S curve, like we'll work up that S curve and get to the top of it. And people will be buying smart homes. Like they buy smartphones. They just go to the store and they, they have, you know, a couple of choices. There's, there's the Android phones, there's the iPhone, and they just kind of know which one they want to pick. And, and that's, that's essentially what's going to happen with smart home technology. Um, it may take a couple of years. It may take less than 10 years. I, I don't think that it's going to ramp up as fast as, uh, something like I, the iPhone did, like where we went from flip phones to all touch panel phones now um, in, in a matter of 10 years. But uh, th- that, that I think is just kind of one of those crazy outliers of, of products that, that happens. But the, the, the thing is like, we're, we're going to see this technology start taking off. We're going to see the, I mean, you and I sit here and we talk about Zigbee and Z-Way. We talk about, um, uh, these these types of standards that um that are that are just making up the basic foundations of what home technology will be in the future um and it it may not be zigbee or z-wave that that wins like it may be wi-fi or bluetooth low energy like we we really don't know and and that that's part of this this early adoption phase and like we whatever gets standardized on and a couple of technologies get put together in a way that didn't make sense before that's when this thing starts to rocket and take off and and that's when people really understand what home technology is and will be buying it like it's an off the shelf commodity um so and, and being able to install it themselves I, I i i don't i just don't agree with how this was laid out like just because there's choice in the market um that leads to confusion i i really don't agree with that i think if people are really interested in this stuff that the, these are those 15% people that own one device, if they're really interested, they're going to go out and they're going to do the research just like buying a car and figure out which one works best for them in their budget and buy it, put it in. Yeah. I mean, some of them certainly will. I, it, I, I well, think it, the, and then you have the p- people like what you're saying that, that they want, you know, they, they go to a car mechanic to, to make that decision, right? They'll go find a car mechanic. Right. to Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's going to take place advisor. too. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, yep. There's a, a lot of different ways to look at it. I think the, the overriding theme that as a, as a professional reading that story, I come away with is, you know, yes, we hear a lot about DIY technology, but but is it really DIY yet? You know, how long will that take? Or are there segments of the market, which I believe there are, of people who just, it'll never really be DIY because they're super busy. And I'm not talking about ultra high net worth people only, right? I'm talking about people with families and kids who, uh, you know, I could figure out how to do my own electrical wiring, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. I could probably figure out how to do my own plumbing, but I'm also not going to do that. Like my time is worth something to me and and I'm willing to pay uh, people for their expertise on that. Even if they're not, even if they're providing stuff that I could run down the street and go buy it at Home Depot. So, you know, there, I think the home technology market's going to follow that same trajectory. And that's what I take away from this story is that for professionals who are in a, in a position to, you know, run a healthy business that that can leverage these uh types of technologies in in their in their product mix uh i think they'll they'll be just fine as long as they get in position yeah i I mean this is the beginning of a new industry really um and i mean we've we've (laughs) we've seen the electricians there they've been around for a few hundred a hundred years or so uh the plumbers have been around for a few thousand years uh and and both of those things like you said you can go down to home depot and buy little parts and pieces and put together a system in your house of plumbing and and electrical parts um but it's really you know sometimes it is easier to to hire somebody else and and then have them do it and and, uh, the plumbing for sure like that turnkey 
any plumbing job that I have at this house is at least three to four trips to Home Depot. Like, oh yeah, some of them pure frustration and Matt in just, <laughs> just steam oh, coming out of your ears. Yeah, you have to like have that fifteen to twenty minute drive to the to the parts store just to let you know, <laughs> just to cool down a little bit, right? It, it yeah. has to take thirty minutes uh, to get there and back, you know. So yeah, I I. Uh, I, I agree with some of the points, I guess, but the premise just doesn't of this particular thing doesn't doesn't. I right. just don't think it's as confusing as it was ten years ago. I think I think the devices we have out now are way easier to set up and deploy than than what I was doing ten years ago. Yeah, I got you. All right, Seth. Well, that's probably a good place to uh, to wrap it up. Uh, like you alluded to earlier in the show, we are getting back into uh, booking mode, so we'll have some guests coming up if you're if you're curious about that uh stay tuned we will be doing that we've got some some irons in the fire there and i think some really great get guests coming up so uh, stay tuned thank you as always for listening we really appreciate it once again a uh, big thank you to everybody who is supporting the show through our patreon program uh, one last time that's hometech.fm slash support if you're interested yep thanks to everybody who is uh coming out and listening to the show tonight uh and jason i guess i'll talk to you next week all right sounds good take care seth